for Eric Garner, for Michael Brown, for Armanu Diallo, for Ayanna Jones, for Ramarley Graham, for Tyler Gurley, Anisha McBride, Anisha McBride, our brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters, our trans brothers and sisters, our trans brothers and sisters, our queer brothers and sisters, our queer brothers and sisters, our black brothers and sisters, our immigrant brothers and sisters, our worker brothers and sisters, to say that their lives matter. Black Lives Matter! This week on the show, Freedom Dreaming. Robin Kelly, author and historian, looks back on a tumultuous year in liberation history, and filmmaker Lizzie Borden reflects on a career of filmmaking for liberation. Welcome to the program. Is there a connection between communists in Alabama during the Great Depression, jazz great Thelonious Monk, and apartheid in Palestine? If there is, our next guest would probably know. He's written about all of those and more. Author and historian Robin D.G. Kelly is a true public intellectual, currently professor of African American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of California, Los Angeles. Among his many books are Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, Your Mama's Dysfunctional, Fighting the Culture Wars in Urban America, and Freedom Dreams, The Black radical imagination. I couldn't be happier to have Robin Kelly with us in the studio. Thanks for coming. Thank you. It's an honor. What's your message to people who are watching what's happening in Ferguson mm -hmm. right now in terms of the future trajectory of the movement that we've seen up to this point right, right. and how it could change the country? Right. I think there are a couple of things. Uh, one, we have to keep in mind that the issue was never just about Mike Brown. It was about a, an endemic system, an endemic sort of history of police violence. So this is a problem that is tied to policing. Uh, that plus the fact that people feel afraid of the police because they are a rogue operation. The, the slogan, hands up, don't shoot. Sometimes we look at that and we see it as a kind of... Um, uh, you know, like we've given up, mm -hmm. like we've kind of, we're com compliant and that's not resistance. On the contrary, what those young people are trying to say is that we want the police to, to operate al along the rules of law, that the rule of law should be the way they function. Mm -hmm. We want the rule of law. We want law and order. The rogue elements are the police. I've got to ask you about the legacy of Barack Obama. He's entering into his... I don't know what, what comes after your lame duck, in your lame duck, even lame duck session perhaps. <laughs> but anyway, the last two years, uh, his legacy civil rights initiative, so-called, his legacy anti-racism initiative, appears to be his program for black boys um, called, black boys and men called My Brother's Keeper. Mm -hmm. How can it be that our first black president's landmark signature race initiative leaves women out of the picture. Um, it, it is a travesty, um, and it's a travesty for two reasons. One is that economic indicators, social indicators, even indicators of violence, suggests that uh, the condition of black women is severe. That, I mean, um, just, just consider the fact that young black women are dying at a higher rate than young black men because of domestic violence, sexual violence, um, partner violence, uh, let alone serial murder, which we don't even pay attention to, uh, let alone the fact that um, the same crumbling schools, the same um, uh, uh, lack of housing opportunities, the same disappearance of the welfare state affects everybody, and especially affects women, young women, children, 
elderly women, I mean girls, uh, the same system that uh, is basically turning schools into prisons or small sort of police stations by expelling students for the status violations, that's affecting girls, you know. And so we're, this is a travesty. The other part of the travesty to me is the lack of outrage uh, among so-called black leadership. Mm -hmm. The position that, that um, a lot of us, uh, I'm part of a group of men who actually signed on to a very strong letter critiquing the Obama administration. And we've got so much pushback mm -hmm. from black leadership who says, look, you're basically undermining a good program. Don't criticize the president. You know, as if somehow criticizing the president is like an undemocratic thing to do. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a democratic mm -hmm. thing to do. So it's really a shame, and it also shows you where we are in terms of our thinking about gender and sexuality. Well, that's what I wanted to get to. It's not just wrong, it's not just a shame, but it also you've always said that the, that the invisibility of women in a discourse has to do with a conceptual problem, mm -hmm. not to pun on round conception, but what's the conceptual problem here? Right. Well, the conceptual problem that produces the invisibi invisibility of women has to do with like, it's three or four different things. Uh, one, that in a patriarchal society, there's just a kind of inbred assumption that, that public life belongs to men. Um, there's that. And that's just a general across race, you know. Uh, there's also the assumption within um, discourse on, on black America that men, black men are endangered species. Mm -hmm. And we see it because the kinds of statistics that are out there in terms of black male incarceration, uh, black male violence, uh, violence, state violence directed at black men. Um, we also know that black men have very high unemployment rates. Part of it has to do with the restructuring of the economy and the kinds of jobs that were considered to prevailing male jobs, low-wage male jobs. And then you have the incorporation of very, very, very low-wage female jobs. So even if black women, which is not really necessarily true, um, even if they have slightly higher employment rates, they don't have, they're not higher in terms of uh, wealth and income, certainly not wealth and certainly not income. Um, education as an indicator. You know, sure, there's evidence that black women sometimes you know, achieve higher at, at the higher end. But when we talk about middle education, black women are not doing better than black men. And so the fact that we have to even frame this in terms of a kind of a, kind of a competition, because mm -hmm. this is, leads me to the third thing. You know, men and women, elders, children, they live in community, live in family. And so if you look at something as basic as the incarceration rates of black men, it's going to have a detrimental yeah. effect on black women, you know, in relation. And so we have to think about, you know, community. We have to think about family. We also have to think about the nation in the whole. Um, the fourth thing, which I think is important, is that, you know, g given my age, I remember when you had a really vibrant and active black feminist movement, National Black Feminist Organization, the Gombahi, Gombahi River Collective. Uh, Barbara Smith, who has a brand new book out now, um, has been thinking and talking about this stuff for a very long time. The Black Radical Congress in its founding convention, 1997, 98, around that time, um, th they put on at the center of the agenda uh, the struggles of black women. And for some reason, you know, as politics become even more mainstream, as we seem to have more quote unquote access, like you said, the legacy of the Obama administration yeah. is to evacuate all that work, all that analysis. And to, to move us back 50 or more years. The civil disobedience happening right now at UC Berkeley as people sit in to protest uh, in, in proposed tuition hikes. Any thoughts on that? Message to them, perhaps? Right. Well, I'm in complete solidarity. This has been um, a real struggle at the UC. I'm, I'm, I'm a UC product. I mean, I did my graduate work at University of California when the tuition then, the fees, were about $1,200 a year, you know, and I'm not that old. Um, now they're, uh, they're maxing out. They're about to compete with, with private institutions. And for what, you know? Uh, to pay a kind of corporate structure. Now imagine what it means to raise tuitions, uh, raise tuition on uh, university students at a public institution 
that is right, UCLA, for example, that is involved in like a four, I think it's $4 billion capital campaign, uh, uh, you know. Fundraising drive. Fundraising drive, right. Um, and with no sense of relief for the students, when student debt is rising astronomically, I mean, it is a crime. I mean, it really is a crime. And so the struggle to keep tuition down isn't about the individual student. It is a big struggle just to maintain just a semblance of a, a public culture a pu about public institutions, mm -hmm. which are just disappearing and becoming privatized. So it's going to be a big struggle. You talk about social movements producing new knowledge and new questions. What are the social movements you see of this moment that are producing the critical new right. knowledge and new questions that maybe could help reverse that trend? All right. Um, well, I think there may be, there's so many. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, but let me just think about some key ones. Uh, certainly the struggle against police brutality is raising questions about this, the national security state mm -hmm. and making connections. Between, that's why I think Ferguson's interesting because they have solidarity statements um, in support of those students who disappeared in Mexico and solidarity statements in support of Palestine and recognizing several things that you know, we need to basically dismantle this kind of racial security state and it's not just local mm -hmm. but it's global. You know, and that we also have the right to self de self defense. That the right to self defense, um, what however we frame that, should be a human right, or should, was a human right, and ultimately it gets stripped back to being transformed into a victimization. Human rights become mm -hmm. victimization. And I think people are thinking through that. Uh, the land, um, the fact that places in like Detroit, even Berkeley. Even L.A. with uh, the South Central Farm, people are seizing land, abandoned lands and trying to turn these into new commons to grow food. Uh, those may not begin as social movements, but they certainly become social movements when the state or private enterprise comes in and says, you know, you don't have that right to land. So the struggle over land, which you never thought of as an urban struggle, you know, I think it's sort of teaching people to think through our relationship between food, food scarcity, mm -hmm. and production. Why is Palestine so central for, to you and to the struggle as you see it? Um, for a couple of reasons. One, having been there uh, and spoken to people and, and sort of been witness to the everyday violence in people's lives, the violence of occupation, and the violence of sort of apartheid inside of Israel itself. Um, it shocked me. It, I mean, I've always been, you know, in solidarity with Palestine, but it's just been sort of one of many things. What I see now is the visible evidence of direct colonialism, mm -hmm. you know, that is raw, uh, that is unapologetic, and a movement coming out of that that is neither about Fatah nor about Hamas nor about those kinds of political parties and institutions uh, that is trying to bring civil society within the occupied territories to end the occupation and to transform the whole region into one democratic state. You know, because the thing I learned about um, the Palestine-Israel issue is that you know, no matter what may pe people may think about Zionism and the fact that African Americans actually come out of a Zionist tradition, a black Zionist, which is a different thing altogether, that is the idea of believing in a homeland, mm -hmm. you cannot build a state on um, ethno-religious grounds. It's impossible. It's not democratic. And once you do that, you basically create a second-class citizenship. You know. And so I'm in complete solidarity with Palestinians who say, look, we, we actually want democracy. We, we want the rule of law. What we have here, Israel's a rogue state mm -hmm. that violates all kinds of principles established by Geneva Conventions, United Nations, and others. And so we want to bring this state into something different. Uh, that doesn't mean that there are not forces you know, within Palestinian communities who who are actually interested in like a kind of neoliberal order mm -hmm. that's secular. 
uh, and that has to be resisted too. Mm -hmm. But for the for right now, um, ending the occupation uh, and opening up the region to one democratic state is a first stage in ending war. And your freedom dream for today? Oh, you know, it's it's hard because I still hold on to uh, a kind of um, socialist dream of seizing back the commons, of eliminating the privatization of everything, um, of trying to uh, create community, the beloved community as, as far as I know, uh, in which violence is not the mediator you know, of anything. What's the thing that makes you happiest these days? Um, <laughs> my three-year-old son, because he's our future. You know, his name is Sekou. He was named after Sekou Sundiata, oh. you know, who passed away, who was an inspiration for Freedom Dreams. And an inspiration uh, for me. Yeah, and just, I mean, just to look at this little boy and know that he's our future and to know that hopefully he will grow up uh, recognizing that he has to be a feminist, that he has to be an internationalist, that he has to recognize that he's not... Um, uh, living just within himself, but his, he's part of a kind of legacy of building this beloved community, which is one in which there's no forms of oppression, no forms of subjugation, no forms of kind of direct uh, produced inequalities, you know, that we can actually do this. And if he can maintain his laughter and his humor, he, he could be part of that. He, he will do this. Mm. Thank you so much, Robin Kelly. It's thank always you. fantastic to talk to you. Keep up the great work. Yeah, thank you very much. This week of celebration, commemorating the 10th anniversary of the War of Liberation, is a time when all New Yorkers take pride in remembering the most peaceful revolution the world has known. I became a filmmaker kind of by accident because I came to New York because I wanted to be a painter. That was my grand ambition. I loved art and I actually came because New York was the place I hitchhiked to when I was at Wellesley where I was studying to be an art history major. One of my teachers recommended that I write for Art Forum magazine and I got to know everybody. I, I, was, I was writing when I was still a student and so I was hanging out at Max's Kansas City and I was at tables with all the great artists like of the time, Richard Serra, Robert Smithson, um, all of them. And it was kind of amazing because I was, I was, I didn't even know what I was hearing. But at the same time that I was doing that, I was really um, becoming radicalized by the feminists. Police have been puzzled in the past week by what they describe as well-organized bands of 15 to 20 women on bicycles attacking men on the street. But what I realized was that I didn't know any black women. I didn't see any black women. I didn't see any women of color anywhere. And um, I wanted to be, I, I wanted, and also I was being a ra radicalized, and uh, not radicalized only by that. I was seeing that I was radicalized by my own sexuality because I was really turned off by the patriarchy and the, everything came to, together at one time. So for me, Born in Flames was the expression of who I was at that time. I was somebody who was rebelling against kind of being a little girl in the eyes of the artists who I was seeing, all of these titans of the art world. And I was living in a world where the feminism that was being talked about was the feminism that I didn't really relate to. Like, what did I have in common with Gloria Steinem? Hey, why don't you leave a lady alone? She bothered you. One film did very much influence me, in that, and that's Battle of, the Battle of Algiers, because in some ways the idea of a revolution never ends. A revolution goes on and on. But for me, it was me being in a situation where I was in a world that I didn't understand. And so that's what I did in film was it just happened to be the medium. And I wasn't particularly conscious of it looking good. I mean, in fact, the worse it, the, the worse it looked, the better, you know, because I wanted it to be really grassroots. I went into gay bars, I went onto the street, I found women and asked if they would be part of this project. And 
we we created this together very it was improvised and then I would take uh, scenes and I would create scenes from that that were scripted and we would go and shoot them and it evolved over five years. I shot Born in Flames on reversal. I would look at it and try not to scratch it. I would edit it down, throw most of it away and then I would just um, make duplicates of what I wanted to save and uh, then I would, I would edit it and then from that sometimes I would write a bit of a script, go back out, shoot from that and then sort of create create a story. There would be a demonstration and I would put my people in it, like, you know, Catherine and Becky and Pat would go to a real demonstration. Other times I would put, I would make a fake demonstration, like the secretary strike. There was, that was a fake demonstration and real people would join in. So I would make signs and real secretaries would be, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll march in that. My own sexuality was being questioned at that time. Um, I was having a relationship with Honey who was in the movie. Every woman under attack has the right to defend herself. One of the huge assets I had was Flo Kennedy. And I don't remember how I got to Flo Kennedy in it because she she was the lawyer. Uh, she knew she was part of Ms. Magazine, but she was like the radical wing. And I wanted to go from the whole spectrum. You fight against it through words. You fight against it in journalism. You fight against it finally through armed resistance. But I always ma imagined the women who did it would be arrested, they'd go to jail, and in like the Battle of Algiers there'd be another, another wave of women who would take their places because that has to keep going and that has to be, keep going because it hasn't changed. It has, hasn't changed for women, it hasn't changed for minorities, it hasn't changed for anyone. It's only gotten worse. Would you say the evening shift? Oh, Lucy, I really can't. Oh, please, Molly. I never ask you to do anything special because I know how busy you are. Lou, it's just too much. I'm sorry. Molly, I try to accommodate you. You are the only girl here with a regular schedule. Now, I always say there's a, there are two kinds of filmmaking, inductive and deductive. You know, it would be deductive is the way I made Working Girls. It's deductive because you have a script and it, that's, you make it from the script. Whereas Born in Flames was inductive because it grew from the Steenbeck. You know, I had a piece of it and then from that it grew. I'm celebrating a whole hour this time. Oh, wonderful. For me to make Working Girls after that, it comes from the scene, the, the montage of women's work. The Working Girls of of America's mystery. Well, I was in an an environment where sex work was intriguing to me and the idea of demystifying sex work then became what Working Girls was about because I thought nobody really knows what middle class sex work is and they have preconceptions about it because several women who I knew during the course of making Born in Flames were sex workers. And I went up to her and I reached under her dress. What I'd seen in the cinema uh, or what I'd seen por portrayed were either uh, were either like women who on the street who were seen as just pathetic, you know, or women giving blowjobs for five or ten dollars, or high class call girls, and both were romanticized, you know, in both m movies or in reality. I'd never seen just the humdrum existence of a brothel, not run not by pimps. But by, and not by some glitzy madam, but just by a woman who was doing it, probably deluded, which this one was a little bit, thinking she's kind of running a dating service, um, but really kind of show what the work was, because it was really sex work, and really show actually that sex work is not all that different from other work. Have you ever heard of surplus value? This was more a film about work than it was sex. And I mean, some people went into this movie thinking it was about sex. And it actually derailed me in a lot of ways in terms of being a filmmaker because people then thought I was an erotic, erotic filmmaker. And this was meant to be the least erotic film that you could ever see. You were meant to be the fly on the wall to see what the women experience about the men coming in as opposed to the typical way you see a brothel film shown.